I've come to Dundee to visit one of my favourite historic ships, RRS Discovery. It was the first purpose-built Antarctic survey vessel. And at the beginning of the 20th century, this took the first British expedition of the modern era to Antarctica. On board were people like Scott and Shackleton who would go on to become legends. Let's take a look aboard. Hey, how's it going? Dan, how are you? Nice to meet you. It's very nice to meet you too, and to be on one of the Britain's great historic ships. Well, the best. The best. the best. So this is the Discovery here in Dundee, and it is my pleasure to have this as my charge every single day. This is the ship that took Scott to the Antarctic for the first time. That's correct, yeah. So Scott, Shackleton, Tom Crean, Frank Wild, all the incredible names of Antarctic exploration, and they all started their journey on board this ship. And it's the only ship that still exists from that heroic age, built for the heroic age, that took people all the way down to the frozen continent. And so before we go below decks, just the background is, why did they suddenly build a ship and send everyone down to the Antarctic? What, what was it about the, this, this new space race? Yeah, it was like the space race. It was that idea of just being the first in to explore something that people just didn't know about. So when they were planning this expedition and going down, they didn't know what was going to be down there. They might find new land, new people, they might find the new spice trades. For them, it was like going to Mars today. This was an incredible expedition, and it was just that drive to explore, to experience something new. And this was purpose-built for it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So all the previous ships had been refitted warships and so on. This was the first purpose-built scientific research vessel. So the discovery really was a first in every single way possible. And the fact she's still here today shows how well they got it right. So this is where the action happens. Yeah, yeah. So this is obviously one of the most recognisable parts of the ship. Everyone's seen a ship's wheel before. Yeah. It would have been open just like it is today. So you would have had two men standing here. And it was only men on board the ship. There were no women on board the Discovery in those days. And you would have had one on each side fighting their way through. No engine power to support them. So it would have just been sheer physical brute strength powering this wheel through. And they've each got a compass here, have they? Yeah, correct. So in the binnacle, you would have had the compass. It's a, a liquid compass, so try and help them get a little bit more. And alcohol, of course, you don't want water in there. It would just freeze instantly. And this would help them navigate their way through. And from here, you also have two very important structures. Yeah, what are these? I've never seen these before. Yeah, so they're known as cuddies. Uh, and a cuddy nautical term is just an extra structure on a ship, um, but it has led to a nickname in Dundee, or, or for a certain generation in Dundee, for a particular part of the house. Oh, I think I know where we're going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a very important part. You don't want to go on a long voyage without these. These are the ship's toilets. And don't tell me, what, is one for officers, one for men? Correct. Oh. Yeah. So on this ship... Stratified society back That's in it. the day. Well, it's Edwardian society. Yeah. So you'd have had one toilet for just 11, and one toilet for 36. <laughs> Three so years. Unfair. Exactly, exactly. As they were sailing along to the other side of the world, obviously masts and sails, but also, by this stage in history, a big engine as well. Yeah, yeah, so she's officially an auxiliary bark. So bark rigged ship, but with an auxiliary engine. So it's not the main propulsion, you use your sails, it's free energy. Use it as much as you can, but when you really need that last push through the ice, the engine built here in Dundee by Gourley Brothers, so a true Dundee ship, but that engine helped them keep going and uh, the engine room just next to us here. Let's go take a look. The design of this ship is breathtaking, but it came at a cost of 51,000 pounds, equivalent to around four million pounds in today's money. We find ourselves in the engine room. So like we said, it didn't always just use the sails. Sometimes it did use the engine. So 450 horsepower. Massive. Purpose built for what they were going to do. But compared to now, it's a, a, a Ferrari. It was a steam engine. So a triple expansion steam engine using about six tonnes of coal every day. That's a lot of coal. A lot of coal. Six tonnes? Yeah. So I bet a truck's worth, and you're having to do that by hand, right. loading that in as you a... You can't keep that much coal on board this ship. Amazingly, they managed to get enough, just. Wow. So they took three years' worth of coal with them, so every spare space was handed over for coal. So anywhere they could pile it up, a 50-tonne bunker here, 300-tonne below, up on deck, you know, risking it being washed That's overboard. Crazy. Huge, huge amounts just to keep this going. So this area would have been crammed with sails? Yeah, absolutely full of sails. This is where they could have spare sails. Obviously the cloth when it gets damaged you can't just buy new replacements in the middle of the southern Atlantic Ocean so you just take what you can with you. So you'd have sails tied up alongside to dry out. The sail maker, the crew member who'd be in charge would do the repairs and uh, yeah also this was this is the only space that they could give over. The rest of the ship so crammed full of coal and supplies so two massive things your sails and spare timber 
had to be crammed into this tiny little space here. You can see, even for me, it's a very low ceiling. This is all they had. Shackleton first went with Scott on this expedition in 1901. He should have taken this ship on the famous one in 1914 because his endurance got crushed in the ice, but this one might have survived. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the Discovery may well have survived it. Now, where the Discovery went to in Antarctica, the complete opposite side into the Ross Sea, very different from the Weddell Sea, but the Discovery was purpose-built for it, whereas the endurance was a pleasure craft for going to the Arctic, so the complete other end of the world, and it was for during the summer months for rich people to go hunt polar bears. So a ship built for very different purposes the discovery would have, hopefully, would have been much better. But then he wouldn't have got the great story out of it. That's it, and we might not have had the discovery. What I find so fascinating about this ship is there's so much that's cutting edge and there's so much that's very recognisable from someone who loves going aboard HMS Victory or a, an earlier sort of sailing Navy era vessel. Yeah, that's it, and it is that real mix. So you do have the modern technologies, the new scientific research, and then you get things like this. So a crow's nest. Oh, that's the crow's nest. Yeah, yeah, so it's obviously in the wrong place right now, um, but the crow's nest, which is just a double-sized beer barrel. There's nothing fancy about it. Strapped to the top of the highest mast. Absolutely, yeah. So at the very, very top of the main mast, this would have been you, 112 feet above the main deck, and this was your protection from the elements. So for four hours at a time, this would have been you inside this barrel oh. with a small ledge to in sit on. In the Antarctic? On. Yeah, yeah. In the roughest seas. I mean, at times, the Discovery could roll oh over 50 degrees. This is the only way to make sure there's no you know, satellite support. This is how you know if you're coming across unknown islands, icebergs, other ships. So some poor soul had to be up here for four hours at a time. Would you have rather been up there or down in the bowels of the ship shoveling coal? It's a tough one. Yeah. You'd certainly be warmer if you were down in the bowels, but up here, the one benefit, you might be the person that very first spots a piece of land nobody else has seen. So yes, yeah, so the boiler room. Uh, powering that engine, so again, storing coal wherever they could, so yeah. 50 tonnes in here and uh, leading down to the two boilers to power your way through, so stoker team, trimmer team, working their whole way through. Right, so what's going on here? So yeah, these uh, sort of letterbox looking features that you will have spotted before, they I've run the full length of the ship. Seen these on ship. Yeah, no, so they're quite unique to the Discovery, not unique to ships in general, but to the Discovery and in those sort of exploring vessels. And these are one of the ways that they help preserve the ship. Um, so we've got a double thick hull. So if you pop your hand through, you'll be able to feel into the, the inner part of the outer hull. Yeah. There's no rats, I promise. And you've got the outer hull into the inner hull and the gap about a foot wide. And in there running from here all the way down below us is a big cavern that they could fill with rock salt. And the rock salt would then mix with any water that leaked through. So fresh water in particular, rain water, and it would turn it into a briny solution and that preserved the ship. Really? Yeah, so fresh water will rot timber, but salt water will preserve it. So the more salty you can make the water that leaks through your ship, the more it will preserve the timbers. And so it's one of the reasons why over 90% of the Discovery's hull is original. It's thanks to these little features here. One added bonus for going to the polar regions is by creating this salty solution, you then don't have the problem of the water that's leaked through, again, the fresh water, freezing expanding and cracking your ship. The salt water, of course, you throw salt on ice, so it stops that problem. So you've got a twofold benefit and it would have just been an empty space. That's clever. Yeah, incredible work. So everything was thought through. It really was purpose built. And so you go through a very important part of the ship. You would have your uh, galley for their food, for which morale. would, yeah, exactly, which would keep the men through the mess deck and the wardroom happy. So this is where the vast majority of the crew would have spent their time. And so, yeah, you would have had 36 men, most of the time, this is where they would spend their downtime. And, and these, because it was, again, there was a big difference in officers and men, wasn't there? So these were the, the, the sailors and the stokers. Yeah, so this is where you had Tom Green. This is where Frank Wilde would have spent their time. It's where you had Whitfield and Quartley, the stokers, those people who are getting you through those ice, the really difficult seas, but this was their space. So 36 men crammed into a space smaller than a classroom, basically. And this was their eating, sleeping, relaxing, washing, everything. This was it for them. And so into where the officers would wow, spend their time. That is amazing. Yeah, quite a difference. <laughs> Different a world. Yeah, exactly. So from, from the all mucking together sort of attitude yeah. domestic to the mahogany lined wardroom for just a living. How much restoration have you done here? Almost none at all. So the, there are a few additions that have happened over the ship's life. Of course, it's been used for various different purposes. So the names you'll see above the doors, they were added on by the Sea Scouts for the 1951 okay. Festival of Britain. 
So, of course, they knew their own cabin. They don't need a name above it. Yeah. Uh, and little additions here and there, modern lighting. But ultimately, this is as was. And Shackleton would have recognised his cabin if he were to walk on right now. That's great. So back in the day, it would have been one person to each cabin, right? That's, yeah, yeah, so they added extra bunks later, so you'll see some like barn cabin here, but ultimately it was one person, one cabin, one bunk. And this was Shackleton's room? That's it, Shackleton's very own cabin. So this was it, this was where he first experienced sailing yeah. to the Great White South. It was yeah. from this very cabin he'd spend his time. And he had no experience whatsoever? No, none at all. <laughs> sailing, yes, but not on a sailing ship. He'd been on big, powerful, modern vessels at the time, and certainly no polar experience at all. He just wanted a bit of adventure, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, a real boy's own journey. Ah, there's the man himself, Captain Scott's cabin. Captain Scott's cabin, larger than most and yeah. even larger than the original layout. So again, one of those little changes I talked about. Originally, his cabin was in an L shape. So behind where you are now, this has okay. been opened into a cabin, but it used ah. to come all the way across. Nice. So Captain Scott would go in and then round so he'd have his writing desk. Okay, nice. This would be his very, very plush, lovely big cabin, lots of space to work. But one big downside, the other side of that bulkhead, was the boiler room. So that space where we talked about. Now, in the ice, they turned off the boilers. They didn't have a steam heating system. And so that temperature, that almost minus 20 in there, would transfer through that bulkhead. And so Captain Scott's cabin was so cold at times, he sat in the full outer layers and even his feet in a box of senna grass, the stuffing they would put into the finescos just to be able to survive in his own cabin. That is ridiculous. He didn't ask if he'd go and spoon with Shackleton. <laughs> Funnily enough, no. Keep you warm, wouldn't it? <laughs> So this is a great place to see the ship from. This is added later, was it? The original bridge was a much, much smaller structure, just to have a quick look. This was then added on in 1925. A second wheel, so you were able to, using a small donkey engine, you had a bit more powers, like power steering in a car, helping you work your way through, but only if you're using engine power alone. As soon as you use your sails, you're back to the stern with that limited visibility. Does this show as they've learned from their previous experience? Absolutely, yeah. So they took on board things that uh, Shackleton and Scott had said in their diaries about the experiences they had, changes they recommended for the discovery. And so when it came to the refit, they took all of that on and made sure the ship was even better than it had been before. This is the ship that possibly could have survived and he could have had that full journey. And that would have been an amazing story by itself, but we would have lost that amazing story of the voyage of the James Caird yeah. and all the legends that have come from it. So in one way, fantastic. In another way, you possibly wouldn't have even been here today had it not been for him taking the endurance. What a place to, to talk about the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Thank you very much indeed for having You're me. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. After an amazing day aboard RRS Discovery, it was time for me to finish this tour with a view. I'm glad I'm not doing this when the ship is peeling through 50 degrees. Well, it's pretty amazing being out here. It's a freezing cold January day here in Dundee. It's probably a few degrees above zero. And your hands, every time they touch anything, it's the freezing, the metal work, the ropes, the wood. And so operating up here in temperatures of minus 10, minus 20, it's unimaginable how hard that would have been. And it'd have been damp, the ship would have been going from one side to the next through something like 40 or 50 degrees. Terrifying. Great view though. And you did, if you're up here, have the chance of being the first human being to spot a new piece of land never before seen by human eyes. What I love about this ship is it's as close as you can get in the UK to that tangible engagement with the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. But I'm incredibly lucky. I'm not only am I visiting Discovery, but in the next couple of months, I'm going on an expedition to the Antarctic to find one of Shackleton's other ships, the Endurance, 3,000 metres down on the bed of the Weddell Sea. Now, History Hit is the broadcaster for that, so you can exclusively follow that expedition by following History Hit's social channels, whether it's TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, whatever you like, we're on all of them. Also, of course, there'll be further documentaries on History Hit TV, so make sure you join the action. 
this is always the most challenging bit. Uh, you basically have to hang upside down. Uh, do some pretty fancy footwork. Uh, there we go. That's it. 